Well, it's good to be with you again. Uh, this is part two of our series on Daniel. In fact, we're going to be doing chapter two, very brief introduction to chapter three. And again, I want you to know that I'm not intending to be comprehensive. We are trying to keep these clear and simple, understandable, uh, a beautiful introduction to Daniel, a man who lived by faith in a foreign land. And so uh, pay attention. These are going to come fast with some good stuff in them. Uh, I hope you enjoy them. And I hope it causes you to go back and read the book of Daniel from a fresh perspective. I would also like to add that do keep in mind that living by faith, that Daniel has this incredible connection with God. A connection that is something that is available to you and to me every day. And that is what's made this story very possible, to be recorded in time for us to listen to today. All right, I want to thank Sherry, another one of her fabulous pictures. Uh, this is like a great piece almost of abstract art. And uh, she just captured the layers of, of the early snow as it comes down. And Sherry, I, I just love this picture. This is just um, approaching Fairfield, Idaho, up on the prairie. You can see the change of season. Oh, I just love this. Um, I, a great master couldn't make a more beautiful picture than this, Sherry, so thank you for that. So, Daniel is my judge. Daniel's name means God is my judge. I said Daniel is my judge. Daniel means God is my judge. I want to be clear on that. And, and in his journey, we have lessons to learn. And you know this is part two. So, in Daniel 2, we see God's movement towards the king of Babylon to reveal himself as the God of the universe through the ministry of Daniel. And as I've said several times, and I will continue to say it, Daniel's name means God is my judge. It is the theme of the entire book. And I will present an entire slide to show you how the judgment theme unfolds in all of the stories we are looking at. So you see the, the significance of that theme. His name and that God is the one who resolves the conflict with good and evil is the gospel in Daniel. It's the good news. It's God's plan for you and for me as well. So I'm just going to read through chapter 2, uh, and, and I think you're going to find it to be wonderfully self-explanatory. Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Then the king gave the command to call all the magicians and the astrologers and sorcerers and Chaldeans to tell the king his dream, or dreams plural. So they came and they stood before the king, and the king said to them, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. The Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we'll give you the interpretation. And the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, My decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut to pieces and your houses shall be made an ash heap. I just want to say we should always be careful how much authority we give our leaders because this king had absolute power and authority. That is an intimidating threat. However, he says, if you tell me the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. And they answered again and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we'll give the interpretation. The king answered and said, for I know for certain that you would gain time because you See that my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, there is only one decree for you. For you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Till time the time has changed. I'm sorry. This is just so amusing to me. Um, I, I want you to know that he's on to them. Okay. Uh, therefore, he says, tell me the dream and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation. In other words, if they can't tell him what is unknown, they cannot give him a correct interpretation. Now the Chaldeans answered the king and said, there is not a man on earth who can tell the, king, the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord or ruler has ever asked such a thing of any magician. 
astrologer or Chaldean. It is a difficult thing that the king requests and there's no other who can tell it to the king except the gods who dwell, whose dwelling is not with flesh. For this reason, the king was angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out and they began killing the wise men and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. With, then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel, oh, I think I skipped a slide. Nope, maybe not. Then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch and the captain of the king's guards who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell him the interpretation. Verse 17, Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hannah, Michelle, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Now you remember when we looked at chapter 1 that one of the spiritual gifts that we spoke of for Daniel was the ability to interpret dreams, a gift from God to him. Now that gift is being manifested in ministry towards Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the season. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we ask of you for you have made known to us the king's demand. Therefore Daniel went to Arioch, whom the God, I'm sorry, who the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king, and I will tell the king the interpretation. Then Arioch quickly brought Daniel before the king and said thus to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, Oh, I skipped a slide. <clears throat> the king uh, answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? And Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded the wise men and the astrologers and the magicians and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God of heaven who reveals secrets and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. Now pause here for just a moment. What was in the mind of Nebuchadnezzar before he went to sleep? What comes as a result of me being king after my kingdom? I think that's just a remarkable thought. He's wondering about the future, what's coming. And he isn't talking about just what happens and who's taking his place. He was wondering about the things that would extend clear to the end of the world. How do we know that? Because God answered the thoughts of his mind. Verse 30. But as for me, the secret was not revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living. But for our sakes, who make known the interpretation to the king, that you may know the thoughts of your heart. You, O king, were watching, and behold a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. 
And whenever the children of men dwell or the beasts of the field and the birds of heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. But after you shall rise another kingdom inferior to yours, and then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. So Nebuchadnezzar now has just had put back into his mind and this dream is now unfolding just like watching a film or a video. It's unfolding in his mind. And then Daniel continues. Whereas you saw the feet and the toes, partly of the potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with the ceramic clay. Now, I, I'm going to tell you something that's really important. Um, as a potter, having worked with clay, you cannot have iron in your, your fine clays because the iron will cause the clay to explode in the kiln. So when I hear this vision of iron with ceramic clay, that's baked clay in it, we're talking about a highly unstable event at the very feet, at the very end of time of this statue. Notice verse 42, as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. And they would understand this as, as Daniel is speaking and explaining it. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men. They will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. We are living now in this period of instability. So, the kingdoms uh, on this slide, notice it has Babylon as the head of gold, followed by the Medes and the Persians, followed by Greece, followed by Rome. And the threads of Rome run all the way down to the end of time. I, I would say the, the political structure of Rome was that of a republic. And with the instability of the entire world and the elements of that, you have this unstable world with multiple kingdoms and it is going to be consumed and collapse. Notice the language here as we continue the story. Inasmuch as you saw that stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and then it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. It's exactly what was in the mind of Nebuchadnezzar. The dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, prostrate before Daniel, and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. The king answered Daniel and said, Truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and the revealer of secrets, since you could reveal the secret. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, the chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Also Daniel petitioned the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon, but Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Now let's pause here for just a moment. Daniel and his friends taken hostage, if you would, taken as prisoners to Babylon, educated in the university's the finest educational system there in Babylon, but continuing to hold on to their faith in God, suddenly now become the most significant men in that entire empire next to the king himself. A brief introduction now to Daniel chapter 3, one picture on the screen. The king's ego results in religious persecution and a death penalty. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar was so enthralled with his head of gold that 
instead of being humbled, his ego swells. He has this entire st statue structured, covered in gold leaf, and he requires everyone to come and to bow down and acknowledge his greatness. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refuse. They face a death penalty for refusing to bow because they worship the God of heaven. And then you have the story of the fiery furnace where their furnaces were heated seven times hotter and they were thrown in and a fourth man was seen in that fire walking among Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God delivered them. One more time, God is reaching out after the heart of Nebuchadnezzar, revealing to him his redemption, his grace, his power to save, his power to protect. One more time, God is reaching for the heart of Nebuchadnezzar. How many times does God reach out for your heart? I hope you enjoy chapter 2 and 3. I hope you go back and read them. Enjoy them. Understand that we have a proactive God. A God who cares about a pagan king and a pagan nation that took young men captive from his chosen people, if you would. And he's watching out for them in the same way he watches out for you. Blessings. Enjoy. We'll see you again. Take care now.